The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. We have been fed propaganda, the wrong food, most of our lives. In truth, most of what we know about the Word of God is a second-hand word. And what I mean by that is we heard somebody else discussing it or saying it. We didn't hear the fullness or the context of it, but we got excited when they got excited, hearing it through the grapevine, and we didn't get it right. And so guess what? We start using imagination again and again and again. This is why everybody has an opinion. Well, if you ask a person, how do you think Jesus will come back? They're going to give you some colorful things. Oh, I think Jesus will come back and it's going to be rainbows and swirls. But that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Lord gave to us. That's imagination. And for the most part, when we begin to imagine things about the Lord, it gets mixed in with the truth. And guess what happens when we when we have part imagination, part truth? We no longer have the truth. See, it is the truth that will make you free. So that means bondage has no choice but to let you go. If you are a vessel of God's truth, you are not in bondage in any way. But we all know we have areas in our lives that bondage exists. See, if we could share all these precepts in a day, and if people could comprehend all these precepts in a day, they would be free that same day. Because a majority of a person's bondage is what they're thinking. Because what you think is how you walk. And how you walk is the way you're living. And the way you live is an expression of your soul and that expression of your soul is your identity and it can be founded in truth or lie and we have mixed up things going on god does things on purpose i notice a lot of people they get highly emotionally involved in these things in the world without full comprehension of this one thing that the world cannot have the truth we don't have full comprehension of that because if we had full comprehension of what jesus said jesus said the world does not have the truth it does not have the spirit of truth the truth comes by way of the spirit the spirit carries the word doesn't it so we know the word is the truth you can't separate the truth from the spirit which is the spirit of truth and the world does not have the spirit of truth that word world it simply means the people of this earth who are not living by the Spirit. That's the world. Lost those who are asleep in the night. The world is considered the night. The world does not have the truth. The world operates purely by pride and ego vanities. That's what the world operates by, which is why it can have no peace. No matter what the world does, it cannot have peace. No matter what they do in the world, they cannot have peace. And if one group has peace, another group dies. It, everything comes with a cost in the world. Everything. And so because everything comes with a cost, that is so deeply embedded in us and we actually believe it. Because we're not used to reading the Bible by way of the Spirit. We're used to reading it by way of the flesh. With all these earthly consequences connected to what we read, and we attempt to interpret the Bible by our carnal minds or our first mind or worldly mind, trying to give it context or some placement in our lives, trying to see if it will work in others. What I'm telling you is that often we test the Bible to see, well, let me see if this will work. Well, let me see if this works. Well, let me see if I submit in this way that this problem will be taken care of. We test it. We put a foot in the water of it, but we never immerse ourselves in it. We never say, I'm going to live right here in this word. We don't normally say that because we're always fixated on the world. Why do we do this? Well, God said we would do this, especially in the end generation. How we live today and what we're doing today is no surprise. It's written in Revelation, but it's also written in the prophecies that God has given us that many breakthroughs would begin to happen. That an awakening unlike any other since the world began will take place in our generation. In the generation that's born into sin that can no longer recognize Babylon, that cannot recognize the end days because you're born in it. You're born in the middle of the last days. Let me give you guys an example of something. Can I do that? I like uh, fish tanks and fish and things like that, right? I remember one time with guppies when I was younger. 
I remember I had this beautiful tank and it was decorated and everything. Guppies have babies often. And the babies grow up and they're quite comfortable. They were so comfortable with the tank that one of the guys from the pet store said, this is almost impossible. That water must be perfect for these things. They just keep, you know, they're reproducing like you wouldn't believe. And in fact, one of the pet stores there began to buy the guppies for me. I remember we were about to move because I'm a military brat, right? And so we had, we moved 24 times or something like that. We were about to move and I put all the fish in this small container. And the small container had some of their decorations so I could keep some of the uh, pH balance of the water and all that stuff in there and it was murky it was kind of murky anyway it was in there for a day the next day I look in there and it's these little babies are born and um, I had those fish in that little thing for about a week now the adults you could see they were stressed I, I can think back now I can see they were stressed but the young ones were happy and thriving and everything else in that murky water so we got to the new place and I got the fish tank set up and everything. I put the adults carefully in the new tank because you have to condition them to go into the new tank. It took about a day and a half or something like that. The adults then, they acted like they were reviving, like they were happy. And all the little baby fish, they ran down into one decoration. They were scared to death, stressed out. They were stressed out. They were not used to the new tank, but the other fish were. Because they came from that tank, they knew what it was. And they were okay. They weren't stressing anymore but the babies were all stressed out the smaller ones because they weren't familiar with that type of environment you know we're just like those guppies we're the babies born in a murky tank and we really do think that murky tank is okay and in that murky tank we're swimming around saying that one day all this is going to be gone but the people who came long before us the ones who knew about paradise the ones who know about paradise are saying, well, they don't understand that they're in murky water. They don't understand that they're in a system of death. They don't understand what they're living in the middle of. They can't see it. Just like those baby guppies, they didn't notice the murky water. It was home to them. It was comfortable to them. Even the water temperature was comfortable to them. But it was a shock to those who knew what the big tank was like. And we're just like those babies. We have no idea what it is not to have the issues we have today. We were born into a murky world. And we continue to say that the end days are in the future. We continue to say that something's going to happen in the future. And if you take a step back from everything, and if you center yourself in the word of the Lord, you begin to see, you begin to read the stories, and you begin to see the standards of men, how they have changed over time, how they have degraded over time, how much sin is tolerated now even more than Sodom and Gomorrah, because what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah happens in the world today, and it's almost like nobody cares. I noticed things like these protests, and people get so emotionally involved. Now, they're in this murky place, having a protest which is wrong against wrong. There is no solution in that type protest. And they're trying to break free of something by the hands of those. Listen, it's almost like if I made a dog a house and the dog comes to me one day and he says, well, I'm going to be free of the house. What am I going to do? Make him a bigger house? If, if He's still in my yard. In fact, he's still eating my food, but he just wants to be free of the house I built him. But he's still going to be in my yard eating my food, not understanding that all of where he goes is a product of my doing. So I appease him for a little bit. I say, okay, I'll get you a bigger house, no big deal. Just like people today don't understand, they're saying we want better conditions, better this, better that. But they're not realizing where they are. They don't know where they are. God asked Adam in the beginning, Adam, where are you? Oh, I heard you walking in the garden and I was scared because I was naked and I hid myself. Who told you you were naked? God said, where are you? God knew where he was. He wasn't asking his location. When God says, where are you? That's more like him talking about the state of your mind, the state of your being. What is your situation? What is your disposition? What went wrong with you? What were you thinking about? Just like today, people don't know where they are. They have no idea that you cannot ask a person in this world, can you be free? Because anywhere you run is going to be the product of the works of man's hands. You know, there's prophecy that stands even to this day that men would not repent of the works of their hands, that they would worship the works of their hands. And they do it all the time. They worship the works of their hands. Anything they did, they worship. 
Have you noticed that what God did, they shove it aside. Anything God did, they alter it just so it can be theirs, just like it says in the prophecies. That they would take a perfect work and alter it and call it their own and then worship it to defile it. The Bible is quite clear. Men do this all the time. Right now, if somehow humanity would look at his brother and say, you know what, I'm not going to fight you, I'm thankful for you. If they were to do that, God would stop everything in its tracks right now. A huge restoration would come. Then it would go further in the restoration act. Then it would be a blessing of blessings would hit. And they've had chances after chance. You see all these hurricanes and things that have been striking, all the earthquakes and volcanoes, all the death and carnage. That was the Lord saying, will you be thankful? But just as it says in Isaiah, the Lord said, why should I stricken you anymore? You'll just rebel more and more. Come to find out when the Lord allows calamities to strike, that is him getting the attention of the people, that their hearts would change and be thankful for those things they lost, even the people they lost, but they still won't do it. Just as it says in the word of God, what do they say? Oh, we'll just do it, build it stronger the next time. We tend to use the word of God for our favor, for our cause. I find that disgusting. The word of God has never been for me. The word of God is for that new creature in Christ, but it condemns me and it never changed. But what man is doing is trying to make the scriptures before them to get people pumped up in falsehoods. Many have sold out already. Why would my heart be for one in the world more than it is for the living God? Why would I try to evoke him and find a way like a spy or a scoundrel to cause God to move? And then God showed me blasphemy. What that was, he showed me what tempts him. When we evoke God to try and get God to do something through sneaky ways by utilizing scripture in the way we want to use it to get God to do something, that is tempting the Lord your God because you're trying to use his power for something you deem as worthy. How easy is it to ask, Lord, that your will be done? See, that's a hard thing to say, and only the flesh will reject that saying. Only the flesh, never the spirit, because the will of God is already written out in the Bible. God desires that none of us perish outside of him. So then his will for all of us is a good one that we don't perish, but that we be saved. His will is that we prosper as our soul prospers. They are intimately tied together. If your soul does not prosper, neither will you. Because if you were to prosper outside of your soul, you would be lost to the living God forever. Even in this world right now, you hear it every day. Lord bless this man, but don't bless that guy. Lord bless this guy, but don't bless that guy. It really demonstrates how much we're trying to evoke or cause God to do something we want, but we do not trust his plan, nor do we know his plan. Can you all see that? But here's the amazing thing. That won't cause anybody any type of conviction, hardly. Very few will ever be convicted by doing such a heinous thing, such a dark thing. Their conviction is almost non-existent in these days. We live in a world with nudity, drugs all over the place, people making excuses for all their behaviors. No one can openly repent and say, you know what, I'm wrong. They're always trying to prove themselves right. Everybody is the mouthpiece for the living God. Have you noticed? Everybody knows what Jesus wants, where he sleeps, how he sleeps, what he's doing, when he's coming, and everything else. More people have become interpreters of what's in the heavens rather than students of the word of God. Something is wrong. And so we've entered into a time, a time that's not going to touch me. I don't know about you. I can't speak for you. I can speak for me. It shall not touch me because I do not seek what the world does because I am not the interpreter of the living God. I am not the expert in the word of God. I am no one's expert nor do I stir up trouble, nor do I work behind the scenes to do deviant things, nor am I double-tongued to say one thing and to live another way. I will not be those things. This season will not touch me. It won't touch me because this season is not for those who are in submission to the Almighty. This season is to break the back of the flesh. But once you're walking by the Spirit, that doesn't mean you're glowing walking in the streets. Once you're walking by the Spirit, you're no longer walking by the flesh. And the flesh is already broken. 
But if you have a problem with your flesh rising up, if you can't get over things, I guarantee you this season will break your flesh. That's what this season is for. It's going to be brutal to the flesh, but it's always kind to the spirit because it's of your Father in heaven. The Father has already told us that our flesh is killing us. So what do you think he's going to do with your flesh? And it's not according to man's timing. It's according to his timing. See, God knows it's just like telling a child in this common day. You tell that child, you've got one more hour on that game. They say, okay, you walk out and you come back. The hour went so quick to that little fella. Oh, please, can I have 20 more minutes? Okay, 20 more minutes. You come back 20 minutes. Oh, please, can I have 20 more minutes? You give him 20 more. If you keep doing that, you're going to be up for days because they're always going to want the 20 more minutes. So a parent who has foresight will say, turn the game off. That's it. What? I'm in the middle of a game. Turn it off. Don't make me repeat myself. See, that's a good parent. It's going to teach a child values. He already knows that if you give that child 20 minutes, he's going to ask for 20 intervals more of that 20 minutes. Just like the living God knows, if he continues to extend the time, we're just going to need more time. We've had just about a lifetime. And you know what we say? Oh, well, the Lord's not going to do it because he's going to wait until I'm ready. Nope, you've had a lifetime and you still couldn't choose. I had a lifetime and I still couldn't choose. You really think he's going to continue to wait? No, he didn't want us to perish. But he's strongly communicating to us through many different things in the world. But he's not playing and he's not joking. There are immediate things in your life right now that are speaking to you. No, he's saying, ready or not, it's coming. He told us that 2,000 plus years ago. He passed it down through all the generations that kept the word of God to get to us. It's very important. We have it in our spirits. We were born with prophecy in us. Yet we would ask him for more time. For what? Why delay again and again? I'll tell you why a kid will ask for 20 more minutes. Because they never thought you were serious in the first place about cutting the game off. They know your intent, but they really do believe they can get away with it. See, a child who really believes that their, their, their game time ends at 8 o'clock, they're going to tell all their friends, hey, I got to go. It's almost 8 o'clock, so I got to go. But the child who is determined to outwit his parents will not tell his friends on the game anything. But when the parent walks in, he already has a game plan. Well, let me ask for 20 more minutes. And he's going to continue to do that. It's going to be based on his timing. But the child who knows the parent is coming in because it's getting close to eight, he's already told his friends bye-bye. He's already put half the stuff up. He's already begun to wind up his cables. Whatever he has to do, he's preparing to shut it down, just like us. Those of you who know the Lord's not joking about his timing, who were born with prophecy in your spirits, you're winding up things in your life because you're not joking. You're not sitting around unprepared, saying, surely the Lord won't come in my lifetime. He'll come in somebody else's lifetime. You're not living your life like that. You're winding things up. You're preparing yourself. You're getting ready. Because all those who will say, well, he's not coming in my lifetime. The reason they say that is because they're, when, have you ever noticed that when things are okay in the world, all of a sudden you start talking about the Lord's goodness. Oh, how long of life he's going to grant to you. But when everything goes wrong, when things go haywire, when people start getting divorces and everything, all of a sudden we want the Lord to come yesterday. And what I'm telling you is when, when things go wrong in our lives, we want to leave the world today. But when things are going okay, all of a sudden we start telling everybody else, just hold on, the Lord is good. He's got you. And the same ones when everything starts going wrong. Oh, I'm so tired, I want to get out of here. But the wise child who believes in the word, who stopped making excuses, is saying, I must be prepared today. See, that wise child will live today as though there is no more time, yet he will also live as though he's going to be here forever. Not a wise child. To conduct himself as though he would be here forever, but to have already prepared for this day to be his last. That's a wise child. That's a mandate for believers, and they don't even know it. It's in the Bible. It's in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. This is the way we live our lives. That creates a standard, a way of balance that you live your life. Without that, you'll have no balance. There's some right now who are so sick because the Lord has not come. 
because they're not obeying the living God in the way they should live their lives. Spirits don't need a mouth to speak. You're a spirit. You don't need a mouth to speak either. When you speak with your mouth, that's to your brothers and your sisters because that's held in this realm. But you're talking all the time by way of your spirit. And when you begin to believe in Christ, to believe in Christ is to know that story. And when you know that story and you accept it, you're going to start to hurt inside. Because Jesus died for you. And that's going to be followed by a truth. And the truth is, when you begin to realize that story, one of the first things you start feeling is, I really do deserve death, but he died for me. I don't deserve what he's given me. Because you begin to see how good he is to you. And when you do that, you create this bubble of life around you. And no death will mingle around life. And it is pushed out of the way by his recognition of Jesus. Because it is by his established name. His name is already established. Everything out there knows his name. They don't need to be told his name. They need to know where you are and who you are. That's why those demons in the Bible said, well, we know Paul. We don't know you. We don't recognize you at all. But why? Because they didn't devote themselves by way internally, by the Spirit to the Lord. When you do that, when you accept that He died for you on the cross and you actually really believe it, it's going to hurt you inside that He died for you. Because you're going to remember all the stupidity, vain, egotistical, and prideful things you ever did. And you're going to see Him committing no sin, dying for you. It'll hurt you, followed by celebration, followed by that you'll have this notion, it doesn't matter what happens to me. My Lord died for me. He matters. See, in your mind, you're going to say the Lord matters. But in return, because you said that, you said that by way of faith. When faith is exercised, a completion takes place. And almost like a life bubble forms around you. And that means hands off to everything not of the Lord. Because when you see Jesus dying on the cross, one of the first things you say to yourself is, why did he die for me? Thank you, Lord. Why did you die for me? I can't believe you died for me. And it hurts. It hurts because you know you willingly sinned. It hurts because you know you don't even fit the bill of somebody dying for. You're worthless to your own self. But you're so thankful that Jesus did it. Because you know that without him, you would not have life. And ladies and gentlemen, that is a huge admission. When you start focusing, upon Jesus of Nazareth, and you start admitting by way of truth circumstances, Jesus is the one that will fend off the devils and the Satans on your behalf. The Lord will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. When you align yourself with the truth of the living God through His Son, Jesus Christ, by way of His true Spirit, He will fight your battles. And those things will see you coming. And at that point, their best bet is to keep people away from you because they can no longer tangle with you. Though, once you're a true believer, you never walk with ego because you know the truth. The truth is, it is by the power of Christ and his established name that if they move, they move because of that. See, there are a lot of people right now, I hate to say it, but they're being tricked and fooled. I see it, I know it, and, and, it, and it kind of breaks me. It was about four years ago, I told you guys that on television, they're going to begin to promote UFOs and paranormal junk. That's all you see on television now. And the reason why they're doing that, they want you to believe that a procedure can break these demons from your life. They want you to believe that when you die, you may linger around. No, you don't. They cannot see what they're dealing with. They believe in their own resolve and their own equipment and through pride and through ego and through vanities. They're being fooled. They're deceiving themselves. All they had to do was believe in the living God. To know that those are familiar spirits. A familiar spirit is something that's already dealt with you. That knows you better than you know yourself. And so they present themselves in a way that will often thrive on your sympathies. They will, they will try to find a way into you. A weakness in your faith for them. So that you empower them to operate in the real world. Because you're the real target. They want to get inside you. We know those are familiar spirits. The sad part is so many people are buying into the methodologies they're using on these things. A time is coming where those things that they have dealt with will attack and they have no defense. If they were lifted up and tried by their own methods, they are effectively consumed 
But I'll say it again. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and a stranger they will not follow. You see, my instructions spiritually come from Jesus. They don't come from TV. They don't come from somebody's manual. They don't come from somebody else's experience. Because I know that these things are liars and they've been lying from the beginning. And if, if, if one of these methods seems to work to eject a demon, they can't even, they verify they were dealing with a demon. You know, you know what it's by? By what they have documented themselves. By what they deem a demon is. That's how they're being tricked. Pride can often, pride blinds you. Pride will make you believe in something that's not real. I know right now, I myself, I have no power against them. It is my stance in Christ. And Jesus fights those battles. His name stands in authority. Therefore, if I stand in him, I stand in his authority. And if he so moved me to say something, I'll say something. But if he does not, they still have to flee because of where I am. That's why Satan has no placement at the throne. An accuser cannot stand in the face of the living God when forgiveness sits at his right hand. That's why he has no placement in the heavens. Accusation does not stand where forgiveness sits. Forgiveness has been given a crown, a rule, which is why people are not condemned right now. Because forgiveness sits at the right hand of the Father. But they're fooling people. And not one time or the methods you'll see on TV. Go inspect it yourself. Not one time. Is it through the absolute name of Jesus? Now, when people say through the name of Jesus, they don't understand what they're saying. When you say something is done in the name of Jesus, listen, it's done in the stead of Jesus, in the place of Jesus. The only way we can do something in the place of Jesus is that Jesus send us. We cannot send ourselves. You don't send yourself and say you're doing something in the name of Jesus. No, because you wouldn't. See, it's just like President Trump. His cabinet just doesn't think up what they want to do. Go to the other offices and say, I'm giving this in the name of President Trump. They can't do that unless President Trump sent them. He has to send them. You can't do anything in the name of Jesus unless Jesus sends you. You don't just make up stuff and do it in the name of Jesus unless Jesus instructs you. Because if you do, it is not in the name of Jesus. It is in your name. And you're trying to throw his name on top of it so it'll work. Demons are not hard of hearing. See, sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll get this thing in your head, well, you have to say in the name of Jesus like 50 times and then they leave. They're not hard of hearing. The problem is, when a person first starts saying in the name of Jesus, they got to come up with some reasons as to doing what they're doing. Did Jesus send them? Because I can assure you, if Jesus sent you to do anything, he would take care of it also. Just like Jesus said, it is God that doeth the works. So when else guess who is doing everything? Jesus is we are not. And they come up with these rituals and all these different things. They're following what they have documented. They're following a way that works for them. All the quotations of words and everything else, they're doing what they have given themselves to do. Because there are thousands that will testify. That's unnecessary. Those who have been almost killed by these things. Those who hold, their whole family was consumed. We're talking about possession, not just simple oppression. Gone by the authority of Jesus Christ. The established authority. The authority is Yahshua HaMashiach. The word of the living God. And it's a living word, not a dead word. But these things have come. And they were always told to come. Because things are becoming very deceitful. Remember, a falling away will happen. I'm just praying that many of you stay the course, that you don't fall for doctrine, but keep the words of the Lord, that you don't become the encyclopedia, the interpreter, the judge and jury of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but you simply become a vessel of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you stand ready, that the Lord may send you. See, the Lord sent the disciples two by two, didn't he? When they were disciples and they lacked nothing, I wouldn't desire my worst enemy to fall. So I do things out of love because when I feel hurt and torment and all these things, when I am familiar with that, why would I want that upon somebody else I do not? I'm not one of those who say, oh, you're going to burn in Hades because you didn't follow what I said. That's hogwash. No, no. While you have life, God Almighty said this one is alive today. He's the reason we're living today. God approved your life today. He did not condemn it. Because if he did, you would not be here. So who am I to come against what the Lord loves? In the scriptures it says, if a person comes against what the Lord loves, they also come against the Lord. 
So if you dislike a person, if you hate a person out there because they did something, you're against the living God who has given them life this day, who approved them to be alive in his creation this day. And you might want to recheck where you stand. You might want to realize something. Anything done to your flesh in this earth is fleeting. It will pass because no one has touched your spirit. No one can touch your spirit except the living God unless you give yourself over to the evil one. In which case, that'll be the loss of your soul. Once you begin to walk by way of the Spirit, you can forgive all things of the flesh. Until you walk by the Spirit, you're going to have a difficulty forgiving those things of flesh. Because the Lord, in His Word, guess what He does? He encourages us to stand up spiritually and to begin to live and to begin to walk and begin to operate, move and breathe spiritually. No longer being of the flesh. You'll read many times in the New Testament where it says we are no longer flesh but spirit. See, we once were moved by the flesh. We got up. We had dreams of the flesh. I want to be rich. I want to enjoy myself. I want to go to the party. All those things were of the flesh. But once you begin to live by the Spirit, you're motivated by spiritual things. You wake up. You're thankful. You may say, Lord, I truly want to help so-and-so. Lord, I stand ready for you to send me wherever you will. Lord, I know that my body is not making it, but I've committed myself to you. So let me walk beyond this body and do your work. Lord, show me what I can say, not to run people off, but to communicate your truth to them. You see, the nature of your prayers changes. You become naturally a person of humility and meekness and of great strength and resolve. You begin to follow Christ like never before. By the way, the more you walk by the Spirit, the greater your entry into the kingdom. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It is only for the Spirit. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemous. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.